culture takes every bit of three to five years, mm-hmm. right? So I'm not at all like the previous CEO. I don't plan to be. He doesn't want me to be. I don't want to be. So organizations take on the character of their CEO, and that, that'll take a good three to five years to change it. Now, you can change it. I mean, I can go in there and get rid of everybody right away. That's not a healthy solution for the organization. And Tell that, say that again think, so that the coaches that do that can hear it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a titan of business here with us today. One of my close friends, one of the greatest leaders in the healthcare area, Peter Banco is the incoming CEO of Bay State, but more importantly, he is one of the most dynamic and impactful leaders I have ever met. Please welcome Peter Banco. Can I tell you before we start? Yeah. Can I ask a question, Peter? Yes. Okay, you have the St. Patrick's Day dunks on. Yes. Yeah. What? are your top five shoes in your closet because your wife said that you're a collector now oh yeah i know you know yeah i got i got a pair of uh classic high top jordans like from the 80s i got a pair of classic low cut jordans and then my son made the he calls him the professor because i I teach a class at ivy league school so he got me the like red and white with like a gold nike on the on the uh, swoosh on the uh, like the ties. Oh, yeah. Like the laces, big, yeah. Yeah, laces, a big a big Nike. I got a pair of Gucci gaz- uh, green gazelles. Ooh, <laughs> okay. Get it nice. Hey, yeah, we've been there. Yeah. All right. Okay, swag. Swagged yeah, up. Swag. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, had we, to start with that. Yeah, had to. Why not, man? Gridiron and growth, you know? <laughs> what what got you into shoes? What what made, what made you kind of think like, you know, now that I'm being successful oh. in business, I'm going to start collecting these. Yeah, both my parents were teachers. We didn't have a lot of money growing up. But my my grandmother had uh, – my grandfather was a chemical company executive. So she'd take me to the mall once a month, back when the mall was kind of cool to go to. I still think it's cool. That's how old I am. Yeah. <laughs> and I would always get her to buy me like a cool set of shoes, sneak, we call them sneakers on the East Coast, a cool set of sneakers. So And I would get one like every semester – in school, and then it just carried through. Yeah. Now, are you the type to walk a certain way so you don't get the creases in the shoes? Yeah, I know a lot of no. people. No. <laughs> so you're going to wear them. You're going to wear them. You're going to wear them. Because I'm old, and I'm just happy I'm walking and not falling. <laughs> but my kids are like, you got creases in those. So I was like, ah, I don't care. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Peter, man, you are one of the titans in leadership that I've ever been around. And in the healthcare industry, no doubt, but the way you lead is so dramatically impactful. When you look at, let's just start, you know, decades of experience in healthcare systems, you get two pe- types of people. People who have great experiences in healthcare, oh, have a great hospital, have a great doctor, you got to talk to them. And then you have people who say, this was such a long process, I had a terrible surgeon. What's key in making a successful healthcare company for its patients? Oh, staying on top of the details, like the small things matter. So a story, my first CEO job, um, the team that was there that I inherited said, hey, let's go meet with the docs. We really got to grow. We rented the Little Rock Club, top of the biggest building in Little Rock, had like 50 docs there, brought in a facilitator. And I made my opening comments. A facilitator made his and, and the head of radiology stood up. He goes, I don't know why we're here. He's like the, the carpet on my entrance to the doctor's entrance is dirty and it's been dirty for 10 years. So, and the food in the, in the physician's lounge stinks. So why would I think you could do something really special with the organization if you can't even provide good food in the carpet? Wow. And I was like, oh, well, we have two hours scheduled for this. This is not going to be great. And so that weekend I went in with the team and we ripped up the carpet. And so when he walked in on Monday morning, the carpet was gone. And I met with the food service people over the weekend. I'm like, here's what we need to have in the physician's lounge. So you got to stay on top of the details. The system, I think, is also built for around the providers, the caregivers. It's not built around the consumer. Mm. So the system that can figure out consumer access. So my my oldest son was in grad school. He was on Medicaid because he was older. Mm. He swallowed a bug while walking on campus. And instead of just going in and taking out the bug, he had probably five visits to the doctor, CAT scan, MRI, two ER visits. The only way we got him to the pulmonologist is my wife's roommate from college's mother 
sold the home of the doctor's piano teacher. Wow. And that's how we got him a visit. And my son called me. He goes, it's not great being a banco in a non-banco health system. So it's cl- it's clunky. And so the systems that figure out how we become more consumer friendly and build the processes around the consumer are going to be the winners. And there are very few, that, if any, that have done that. What does it really mean to be a CEO? Like I know mean, yeah. a lot of people come out of college and I want to be a CEO and <laughs> I want to climb the corporate ladder to be a CEO. What does it really mean? Yeah. I didn't think CEO was possible for me, but both my parents were elementary school teachers. Like we had no CEOs. I didn't know what they did. I wanted to be a helicopter pilot, right? And at, at some point that became possible. And so I don't actually do anything as a CEO, <laughs> right? My executive coach told me early on, he goes, there's only two things that you control. Uh, one is what your office looks like and two, who works for you. So talent's important. Building team is the most important thing the CEO does. And then relationships. So all the way up to COO, you're you're paid on what you accomplish, the tasks that you do, operations, making sure things happen. And then it flips when you go to CEO. That's the biggest step is you're responsible for relationships. So relationships inside the organization, in the community, outside the organization, any stakeholders, the financial markets. So my job is thinking from vision and strategy, building a team that can execute on it, and then managing relationships. One of the things I think is key about you, though, and you mentioned it both in that initial meeting in Arkansas when you were first CEO and just right there, a coach, and you're listening to the doctor. What prevents CEOs and leaders from taking feedback and then turning that into action? Oh, right? ego. Really? <laughs> yeah, ego, right? And so you you start to close your circle. People have trouble speaking truth to power. So the environment is you've got a bunch of people that could be saying yes to you all the time and affirming what you're saying even when you're absolutely wrong. So being able to listen, being able to give people the psychological safety to say, hey, Amper has no clothes here. There's something wrong going on. And that could be either be in a group setting or one-on-one to come into your, in your office and say that this isn't working or you need to reconsider this. Being able to listen. CEOs need a healthy balance of ego and humility, right? And there's a fine line. All CEOs are a little bit narcissistic, and you have to be mm-hmm. because you're alone. There's no peers. You're going to face a lot of criticism. Not everybody's going to like all your decisions. It's not a popularity contest. It's not Congress and a democracy. So I, I think ego gets in the way and being able to listen. So I've made a habit of anybody in the organization can email me directly. Mm-hmm. And within 24 hours, I'll get them a response. And I've got a weekly blog every Monday to talk about what I'm thinking and people can comment on it or email it. And then just being visible, getting out there, doing podcasts, live streams, making sure people know you're accessible and can tell you what's really going on. Love that. Peter, you've been in a lot of different leadership positions. I would love to know what does it look like from a time frame perspective? You're going to start at base date. Where do you expect that company to be at the end of your first year and then at three years, five years. I'm thinking about in terms of the NFL and where we played. You know, people want to have success immediately. Yeah. And I think it takes at least three years to really transform a culture. You just can't do it. Yeah. I think you're right on the three to five year range. You can do it faster, but it's how much change can you tolerate, right? Mm. So Bay State, I like turnaround. So this is a turnaround. It needs some financial fixing. We need to rebuild the balance sheet. We need to grow the organization to scale. It's a little bit small for long-term survivability, not short-term, five years. So look for partners, look to grow. So I I would say out of the gate, you got to get quick wins. There are four-hour waits in the ER there. That doesn't work, right? Mm. When the board tells you, I can't go to the supermarket because people know I'm a board member and complain about their weight in the ER. So we've got to get some quick wins around consumer access, making it friendly. We've got to get some quick financial wins because the financial markets, the rating agencies are looking for performance. The organizations had two or three 
tough years in a row. So getting some of that financial stuff. But that financial turn takes 18 – if I started day one on it, it takes a good 18 months to start showing results. So you're right. Culture – takes every bit of three to five years, mm-hmm. right? So I'm not at all like the previous CEO. I don't plan to be. He doesn't want me to be. I don't want to be. So organizations take on the character of their CEO, and that, that'll take a good three to five years to change it. Now, you can change it. I mean, I can go in there and get rid of everybody right away. That's not a healthy solution for the organization. And Tell that, say that again think, so that the coaches that do that can hear it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, the NFL is a performance-based industry. You perform or you're not there anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, most companies aren't like that, right? Yeah. Uh, healthcare has this niceness about it because we're taking care of people. And, and so we're reticent to do the tough stuff. But it takes a little bit of time. But you also know, like, if the person's not – for me in leadership, if they're not making progress at that one and a half, two year mark, then it's probably not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I think that that's right. I think NFL owners get into trouble when they listen to social media or the media and they don't actually take the time. And I also think that they make, to your point, the wrong decisions about building the team. You know, I was I was at a team that I won't name, but they hired they're still paying three coaches that are no longer yeah. there. Yeah. And then you made poor decisions in terms of who was going to lead your organization. And you didn't take the time because you got into this scarcity mindset. Well, I got to make a decision right now. Right. No, make the right decision. Yeah, I like the word scarcity because there's you get that gets you into that victim martyr role, right? Mm. So I, I'm not on LinkedIn. I don't read what people comment on newspaper articles about me. It's all negative, right? Mm-hmm. And the detractors, you got to have that mindset of abundance, right? Things are positive. When the wind blows one way, you can't you can't go there. You've got to stick to your direction. When you talk about creating change, what do you anticipate anytime you're creating change? Cuz all of us our audience as well, we're making small changes in our life, changes in our family, you're making them on a company scale as well. So when you go in, you say, okay, we're going to make these changes. Do you smile and think, okay, we're going to have some people say, this can't be done uh, yeah. in the first three weeks. Yeah. But then in eight months, we're going to have people say, are you sure we can do this? What's that, when you know you're creating change, what's that timeline that you've experienced in terms of how it's absorbed? Yeah, the change is the what. There's a great book by William Bridges called Transitions. So he talks about, it's the psychology, like change is more about the inside the head. So they're going to be early adopters. Find out who those are and get those on board quickly to get out there informal and formal, sell it for you. And then there's the folks that kind of hang out in that middle range waiting to see what's going to happen. And when it's successful, they're going to jump on board. They may early on want to abandon ship. And then there's the people that take a long time, right? As a CEO, executive, you've got to think about, all right, I got to get people on board. I've got to help manage that messy middle, which is the bulk of the people, and get some wins, get them there. And then how much time do I let the people try to hang on to the old before they switch? You know, sometimes new in an organization, you know within the first 30 to 60 days who's not going to make it. Mm -hmm. Some may take longer, but you've got a pretty good idea. And the balance is timing and pacing too, right? So how fast do I go? How much do I go? How much do I push? How long do I let people wait on? So for me, it's that people piece and the timing and pacing is the biggest thing. And then how to get supporters Mm because you're not a leader without followers. You know what's very interesting to me as we're just talking through this is that – and Coach D'Antonio at Michigan State, go green, go green. Uh, Coach D always said leadership is a small word for such a big job. And everything that you're saying is understandable and digestible. But actually executing those things is really hard because you're dealing with emotions and people. Talk to me about what it's like to get those people over the line to, to buy into what you're talking about. Yeah, it helps if they designed it on the front end. So the easiest thing we did here in Colorado was we, um, my my uh, now 17-year-old baseball pitcher, he had a good outing on Friday. He spent 10 months in a wheelchair because of a surgical error. No one at the hospital here in town, I won't name names, but it wasn't one of mine, 
It was probably one that did with did something with kids. Uh, never came and said. He said, "All I want to do is say them to say I'm sorry and that this won't happen again." So we we right after implemented a, what we call the high reliability organization. So it's in the nuclear industry, aircraft, HRO. Mm-hmm. That was the easiest thing that I ever implemented in my career because you're trying to get a bunch of people who are in an industry wanting to care for people talk about better care for people. So I didn't have to, I didn't have to sell it. The team designed it uh, from scratch, and, and it worked because they designed it. So I would say having the people on the front lines that do the work design their work. I don't treat patients. I don't do surgery. So it makes sense for the people doing the work. So I, I would say that's the easiest one to going on communicating like multiple times, multiple forums, creating a case for change. Like, why are we doing this? It's not mm. just Peter's whim. There's thought behind this. So I would say, again, the, the people piece and getting people involved and engaged in the work is important. You said, you told me before, the biggest things that companies get wrong is firing people. Yeah. Which I loved hearing that because they don't get that wrong in the NFL in terms of if they don't like you, they're going to fire you. Yeah. Right? And no, they may not be right in firing you. Yeah. But it's done. Yeah. How come companies struggle so much in firing people? Yeah, I got a book coming out. I finished the first draft two weeks ago. On yes. This, and I, you've got a paragraph in there about that exact same conversation. Now, like, why do people like Elon Musk and Nick Saban and uh, Jack Welsh, why didn't they struggle with it? Well, they have a special kind of mentality, right? And so I attribute it to – I had my mother's German, so everything's like factual. Like, it is or it isn't. Yeah. Like, you're making it or you're not making it. I think it's gotten worse with post-COVID, like we were struggling to hire someone. So if I fire that person, who am I going to get to replace them? Mm-hmm. People think leadership is a popularity contest. So like people aren't going to like me if I'm firing someone. Well, yeah, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's not like Congress where people vote you in every two years. I mean, here, well, it's so at base state, I got 13,000 people relying on me to get it right. I got to get it right. And you got to make sure you have a leadership team. I think people use excuse, HR and legal folks get in the way sometimes. And so you're, you know, when they get in the way, you're going to give up. I think sometimes we make hiring decisions that were wrong. Mm. And then it's hard to admit we made a mistake and, and deal we with it. We see that in the league all, all the yeah. time. All the yeah, time. like I drafted somebody <laughs> and they're a bus and now, you know, I'm paying them a lot of money and I got to stick it out. It's a reticent to make tough and difficult decisions. At the end of the day, as a leader, you're responsible for direction, focus, having the team, but you're responsible for taking action and producing results. And mm-hmm. I think people confuse activity with results. I had, I had a leader once say, I'm doing a lot of things. I was like, none of them are working. So <laughs> <laughs> like if – like if you're playing in the NFL and what you're doing isn't working, you better change it or you're going to be playing for another team or you're not going to be playing anymore. Yeah. As Denzel Washington would say, don't confuse movement with progress. Yes. Man, yeah. You're doing a lot of movement, but you're not going anywhere. Right. You can yeah. move in place. Right. <laughs> right. Well, what's the words you use when firing somebody? Like in that meeting, now I take it you've given them an opportunity to correct it. Yes. And given them the tools. But like, yes. okay, now we're in that meeting. You know, you're firing Peter Banco. Yeah. What do you say? First, and I've been fired before, so me too. I, oh, us too. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, that changes your mentality on 100%. leading and working hard, but it also changes your mentality when you fire someone. So the first thing is be kind. This is not personal. It's not that they're a bad person. Well, there's sometimes <laughs> we sometimes we have to fire people because they do really bad things. It's a it's about the business and it's about leadership. Make it short. Keep it short and sweet. Take care of people on the way out. So mm-hmm. people watch how someone leaves more than when they come in. 100%. So when I left, I didn't get a ton of severance. That impacted my family. You don't want someone losing their house or their car. I had someone I had to let go that was in the process of rehab for addiction, had been for about 18 months. and was making great progress. I made sure we gave them health benefits, but that, that continued well beyond the period of severance, right? So that Something they were- small that you could do, make a huge Right. Effect. If it's not, like I've had to let go people. Like, so sometimes you're downsizing an organization. There are good people that have to go. Make your network available to them. Help them get out placement. Uh, call people for them. So- Treat them with kindness. Uh, but in that meeting, you got to make it short and sweet. 
get to the real issue. Yeah, in, in a lot of cases, it's without cause when you're dealing with big leaders. Mm-hmm. So just say, hey, it's a business decision. Let's move on. Here's what we're going to do to help you, and then let HR and legal take it over from there. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the best team you've been a part of and why it was so great. Oh, can I go back to like Babe Ruth baseball? Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Babe Ruth baseball team, we won the city championship three years in a row. We had this coach who didn't have a kid on the team, which helped because mm-hmm. he was independent. He was a little bit of like a 60s hippie. <laughs> I, he drove a Jeep without a top on it. I didn't realize some of the paraphernalia, you know, I was like 14. Some of the paraphernalia in his car was marijuana stuff. <laughs> but he he worked us hard and we had each other's backs. Like I'm still f- friends on social media and kind of converse with that team right at 14. Wow. And, you know, you only played three seasons together. So for, for a couple months, but I would say work-wise, the team I had here with Common Spirit was the best team I ever had. We knew each other personally. Like in, in COVID, when our kids weren't going to school, people got our kids together at somebody's house just to have social interaction, right? That doesn't happen on most senior executives teams. So there was a got your back. And I would say the easiest way to get fired with the team was not being a team player. So I, I had to let two people go that the team came to me and said, they can't, it's us or the, or that person, uh, we can't have them in. Can't have them in the locker room anymore. Mm-hmm. How how important is vision, values, the mission, in articulating that and getting the buy in from the team? Absolutely critical. We know that mission, purpose, values driven organizations outperform the rest. So the, the, that mission statement and those values aren't just something on the wall. And that's what attracted me to Bay State when the board was saying were mission driven and they weren't they aren't a faith based organization and we're here for the community that that's what gets me up in the morning right I, I could probably be doing anything in the fortune 500 but healthcare you get to take care of your neighbors and your community and so mission's important so what values i tell folks when they join the organization like if the mission doesn't resonate with you personally or professionally you're in the wrong place like to end in your resignation and the values are how we treat our customers, how we treat one another, who we choose to do business with, right? So you, too many organizations get into these mergers and find that the values aren't aligned, right? We're, we're not synced up. And so how do you run an organization where you're not on the same page and not driving to the same direction, not have the same mission, not value the same thing? So uh, for me, those are the, those drive everything. The most impressive thing about me regarding you as a leader, you make no excuses and you succeed. And what I mean by that is diversity, equity, and inclusion has gotten a lot of knocking, support. It's very polarizing. Yes. And yet in 2018, I came and spoke to your company and you had not one, but two black neuroscientists, neuro, neurological doctors, right? What do you call those? The neuro... Neurosciences. Yeah. yeah. Never seen that. I've had nine surgeries, been in hospitals all over the country, never seen not one, but two black neuroscientists. You also had color throughout your leadership as well as women involved. So for all these people that say DEI doesn't work or the focus is wrong, you've just done it and included other people before it was even a conversation and it's created tremendous results. What do you say to people who are still on the sidelines about including people that look different yeah. or sound different? It, it's now people are now saying, "Hey, it's a it was a fad. It d- right. didn't work." Well, that's BS, right? You made it a fad in the organization. So we, we adopted. So we started in 2018, and some of the things that came up at that time were one: my daughter is in med school, was rotating in one of our hospitals. With, I told her, "You're only allowed to rotate with female surgeons." Because you're not going to see what life is like if you're rotating with a male. And she saw, saw some things like people approaching the sur- trauma surgeon that she was rotating with and saying, a nurse, can you help me with this? Mm-hmm. It's like, uh, no, she's a doctor. And some things in the OR. And then the other one was I was recruiting a young executive. He was like 26. And my COO, Eddie, uh, Korean-American, this 
potential person was Korean. And he goes, uh, the only reason I'm talking to you is I know there's an opportunity for me. Mm. I see someone that looks like me in a high position. He goes, but I interview in a lot of or, or other organizations and that's not the case. I don't see anybody that looks like me. So I know maybe I don't have a future here. So that clicked. But it, when, it was when George Floyd was murdered, the organization, the groundswell said, stop talking and start doing. Mm-hmm. So we developed a written framework. All of our executives' pay were put at risk for it. So like when 25% of your pay is at risk, it's not a fad anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And we, we took a comprehensive look, like what does governance and leadership look like? What do our policies look like? How are we hiring people? What does our slate look like? How are we marketing ourselves to diverse communities? How are we impacting the community? So we put a $5 million fund where we're funding community agencies. So it's it can be the fad. I also had a great, great person. Played football for Stanford. He has some great football. So played for Denny Green and Bill Walsh. Nice. Physician. Put him in charge. He, you know, and he grew up in the community, so he is biracial, so he experienced things that one shouldn't experience. So it made it real for folks. Mm. So I think you can make it a fad and create a position, but you've got to you've got to put the board behind it. You got to put your money behind it. You got to put it in writing and hold yourself accountable to it. So what were some of the stories of impact that you noticed from bringing on diverse talent and retaining them? COVID, we played a big role in the vaccination because, of the, I mean, Tuskegee is real, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> like that legitimately happened. real. And there are still people alive that went through it, right? And so Ozzy and others were able to be out front. So our vaccination rates in Colorado of diverse communities were far better than most states. And the, go- the governor in Colorado took that under his wing, too. You know, our primary care docs did a great job. So our normally all the screening tests in diverse communities are less. Mm -hmm. Ours were not. So our primary care docs went through a concerted effort, did a lot of training and like unconscious bias and made sure. So by the time I left in January, I could assure you that regardless of race or gender or gender identity that people were getting the same screening rates for the things that we needed to get screened for. That was probably the biggest one. Wow. Untold impact there. Yeah. You talked a little bit at the beginning about an executive coach. Yeah. You still work with your executive coach. And yes. On and off. Talk to me a little bit about, all right, we talked about company values, but personal values and self-leadership and what the, what does that look like in terms of, I think you always need to work on yourself to be a better team yeah. member. Yeah, like when you got to the NFL, did you stop getting coached? No. <laughs> Do you think Tiger Woods still has a coach? Yep. Yeah. So why would you get to the highest position in an organization and then stop stop coaching? So I've had my coach on and off. So he's working with me now on my transition to a new organization. So self-awareness amongst leaders is huge. So you've got to know what you don't know. You've got to know what you're strong in. So when you're doing executive coaching, you do a lot of assessments. I'm a big fan of the Hogan assessment. Mm-hmm. That one doesn't lie, right? <laughs> I mean, your personality is formed by the age of five. That tells you what your personality is. So when I hire execs, we do a Hogan, and then we put them through a whole day of organizational psychology. So I get a full report back before we pick someone, and we're able to interview them based on so, for example, one of my weaknesses is mischief. <laughs> I think it's probably yours, too. Yeah, yeah, always, <laughs> I don't know yeah, you yeah. as well. But when I get bored, I get myself into trouble. Like, so I'm, when I get bored, I'll make changes for the sake of change sake, and that's probably not good. So uh, the other one is I'm, because of the German mother, I'm probably not as warm and fuzzy as most people. So when I interviewed for this job at Bay State, I did a, did a full-day assessment. And the person said on the other side, he goes, what's the question I haven't asked you about your personality that I need to? I was like, yeah, about being warm and fuzzy. He's like, you know about that? I was like, yeah, I know about it. <laughs> so I, I've developed mechanisms to be a little bit more warm and fuzzy and approachable. So you got you to gotta be self-aware. And then it's good to talk through situations like as a CEO. So you're dealing with someone you have to fire. Like, hey, am I reading this the right way? Is it? Am I making it about me? Am I making it about them? Or is it 
the business and what's going on here. So having someone to talk to, especially when you're the CEO, when there's no peers to talk to. But the other piece is with a coach too, you've got to develop a professional network of other CEOs across other industries. So you have people to talk to just so you're you're attuned to what's what's going on there. Yeah. I mean, I'm dealing with an issue in my new job that I'm on the phone with my coach once a week around so that I, I'm warm and fuzzy and, and being political <laughs> and, and not blowing it up. Right? Yeah. What do you say to people who are trying to get to where you're at? They want to be a CEO and you know they're going to take the same classes you took. They're yeah. going to probably read half the same books you read. But where does the difference come in? Where does the difference between a great CEO and an average manager come in between all the different academic and personal growth that people can do? Where is the part that they have to find themselves? Yeah, it's not academic at all. So I would say I'm, I call myself the King Arthur, right? So who should have been in, in Camo? Who should have been the CEO? Should have been Merlin, right? He's <laughs> yeah. the wizard. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that dude only shows up when things are really bad, waves his wand, and then disappears and goes where, wherever, right? And so King Arthur pulls a sword out of the stone and all of a sudden is the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like I felt. I never aspired to be that because I didn't think it was attainable. I, n I never thought I'd get there. So people that try too hard to get there, you're not going to get there. You've got to prove yourself as an operator. So can you run as a COO or VP of, or senior VP of operations? Can you run the business? And then someone's going to give you a shot as a CEO. But if you can't actually run the business and make it work, no one's going to give you the big shot. And so it has nothing to do with where you went to school, what you studied. I would say I wish I had studied more psychology because the CEO job is probably 80% psychology mm -hmm. and about 10% giving therapy to people. But yeah, I would say not aspire, just prove yourself as the person that can get things done and produce results. This has been incredible. Yeah, one more I've got for you. Of the CEOs I know, you're one of the few whose family still loves them and who is involved <laughs> oh. in their family yeah. you know, as well. And I think it's easy when you get to a place of performance or high importance like yeah. a CEO to say, hey, I'll be there when I can. And when I, How have you managed to continue to grow the love and connection between your family and yeah. your children while achieving such great That's things? That's in the outline for my second book. All right, there we so go. So to be a CEO, it's a family job, right? So one of I've got a great spouse, so I have to admit I wasn't always there for the games, the plays, uh, but Liz was always there. So I, I, I attribute our kids' success, and I wouldn't have been a CEO if I didn't have a great spouse and partner because it's a it's a family thing, and, and my kids know that you know when you, they're in school they're on display, right? Because right. everybody knows Dad is the CEO of the big health system or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when they mess up at school, it becomes everybody's business. So if your spouse, and I see this a, a lot with up and coming leaders, is their spouse is not ready for the demands. The demands, like, you know, someone, we're moving to Springfield. I think we're building our seventh house. And someone's like, seven. I was like, yeah, we've had to move a lot, right, for my career and other things. And, and if you don't have a supportive spouse and kids, it, it's not going to work. So I tell people, if your family's not on board with you being a CEO, it's probably like the NFL too, right? If your spouse and kids aren't ready to pick up their bags and move across the country, then it's probably not going to work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I, I like Denver and the Broncos. Well, I got to I gotta go play for the Steelers, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I got to sell my house. I got to move new schools. I'm moving a kid junior year in high school. They got to be on board. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, Peter... Thank you so much. An incredible conversation. The Peter Banco, ladies and gentlemen, an honor to have you here on the Gridiron Growth Podcast. An honor to be here. Thank you. Appreciate you, Peter. Thanks. Thank you. 